Welcome back. I'm Brandon, the HBAR Bull, once again joined by Zepsi. We both do some contract work for the HBAR Foundation, but we don't do these weekly updates in any official capacity. We're just coming to you personally to give you the latest in the Hedera ecosystem. Welcome, Zep. How's it going, Brandon? It's going good. This was a fun week. There was a lot of exciting stuff to come out, and I think we're going to have a really good conversation here today. But as always, none of this is financial advice. Use it for entertainment or educational purposes only. So the first thing I wanted to get into was something that came from Blade Wallet, and that is that HBAR is going to be listed in Japan, which is a pretty exclusive club. Do you have some more information on that for us? Yeah, so all hats off to Sammy um, from from Blade Labs and their and their BD team there because this has been, as I understand, sort of you know a few years in the works. It's a notoriously stringent place to be able to get listed. You know, it's it's a, it's a very harsh regulatory environment, or or rather, they do everything by the book, incredibly methodical because you know that they really are pioneering this kind of adoption of DLT and Web three, but they want to make sure they do it right. You know, they want to make sure that the people that they're supporting, the companies they're allowing their citizens to invest in are the real deal. And so when you think how many cryptocurrencies there are in the world, you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands, only 58 are listed in Japan. And, uh, you know, when you look at the list, there's about maybe five or six on there that are, are real players. You know, you don't have Algorand on there. You don't have companies like that. But now you have Hedera. If I was a Japanese citizen uh, and I saw Hedera come on to the market, HBAR, and I saw that Nomura Bank, which is a you know a big Japanese bank, were part of the council, I'd look at this and go, wow, you know, these guys, you know, they must be serious. And then I'd see that staking is coming down the line. I mean, I don't know how many of the 58 offer staking. I assume it's much less than 58. I assume it's harder to get, even harder to you know get listed for staking. And so I think we're going to be in a situation here whereby, you know, there's this new coin on the market. You know, it starts on one exchange, then goes on to the others. And they see it's no more. They see that staking is being offered. And I, and I think we're going to get a lot of a lot of uh, new H bar bearings in Japan, which is for me, that's, you know, that's that, that's amazing to see. I think 70 percent of businesses, uh, according to the press release in Japan, are aware of crypto. And over 20% are already using it in, in, in some faculty. Of course, Blade Labs, their strength is in this enterprise side as a wallet, you know, enabling this sort of en- enterprise usage. And so it looks like there's going to be a really solid relationship here between Blade and between Japanese enterprise. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, a, a great story this week. Fantastic to see for sure. And one of the things that excites me about this, you mentioned how conservative they are from a regulatory standpoint. And of course, we're having some regulatory pressure in the United States. I'm hoping that this uh, bodes well for Hedera in other jurisdictions as well. I do want to stay in the Pacific realm right now because we have an awful lot of stuff coming out of Australia. We know that it's a hotbed for Hedera interest, for Hedera building and everything else, but we're getting a lot of news out of there. So the first thing I want to touch on is Fresh Supply Company. Now, we talked talked about this with Rob Allen a few weeks ago. They're doing a solution that uh, is in supply chain and also payments in that supply chain that used to leverage MasterCard, and now they're moving over to Hedera. A couple of our community members, some of the detectives saw doing some network analysis that some of the transactions that were coming through had notes from Fresh Supply Co. So that was confirmed by Fresh Supply Co. themselves on Twitter. So I got in contact with David. He's the CEO of Fresh Supply Co. And hopefully next week, I'm going to be able to get an interview with him. Did you see some of these things come out on Twitter as well? Yeah, I mean, I think FSCO is the new kid on the block, you know, in in terms of an an exciting use case that's come organically to Hedera through just seeing sort of the strength of the partnerships or rather the governing council, you know, Fresh Supply Co, um, you know, they were the biggest. So this is this is a statistic. They were the biggest user of, uh, of MasterCard provenance, you know, their, their Sunset blockchain. And not only that, but they're a partner of Commonwealth Bank, which I believe is the biggest bank in Australia. So these guys are serious players. You know, they're, they're, they're not here to mess around. They're here because they want to leverage the token service, you know, the consensus service and beyond. I'm sure, you know, this is the start of a, of a really, really interesting relationship between the Hedera network and another big player within the ecosystem. 
Yeah, it, it's going to be big for sure. I'm looking forward to that discussion next week. So the other thing, of course, that's going on down in Australia is their central bank pilot for CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. And there's 14 different teams that have been selected to do various aspects of that pilot. And one of the teams is not centralized, and they're exclusively using Hedera for their portion of the pilot. So I caught up with Nick. He's a director with Not Centralized to get some more insights. It was a really fun conversation. So listen in. I'll go ahead and start with Nick. So Rob Allen gave us a taste, but can you give us some more information on what exactly you're doing with the Central Bank of Australia? Yeah, absolutely. So we are very honored to be included in the pilot program for the CBDC, uh, also known as the EAUD down here in Australia. And essentially, we are part of a group of 14 submissions that were solicited through the DFCRC, which is working very closely with uh, with the RBA. And our particular use case is one in the construction sector. Uh, we have built a protocol that allows, in effect, a digital escrow to greatly reduce the risk involved in long supply chains in the construction industry. I got you. So it, it certainly sounds like a good use case, but you know, why does this have to be done on a DLT? Why can't it be done with traditional technology from Web2? Yeah, look, that is a very, very important question. And the whole reason we wanted to be involved with this was to demonstrate the benefit of having these underlying, in terms of the CBDC, what well, that provides this underlying proof of reserves function um, in, uh, in tokenized form that you just can't achieve with a Web2 solution. Another thing we think is interesting is the way that we have built this digital escrow, the collateral that is placed in that escrow account remains on the balance sheet of the depositor. Now, in a traditional Web2 world, you cannot achieve that. Uh, you can't earmark collateral uh, in the way that you can by switching fiat into stables and dropping them into the smart contract. You can't do that with, with liquidity that remains on the balance sheet of a large construction company because that liquidity fungible. You can't separate it or earmark it. The only real way you could achieve that is by moving it off your balance sheet into a separately managed escrow account with a trustee sitting over the top of it. And then it's then it is quite literally off your balance sheet. It's into a separate uh, it's into a separate trust account. So the ability to do this and to program the money to program this collateral with tokenization uh, and uh, in the stablecoin form that it is, that's the big unlock that we see is really interesting. And then you add that layer of CBDC underneath with proof of reserves from a, a central bank issued digital currency. It's quite a powerful solution. Understood. So I have another quick question. Why did you decide to build your proof of concept on Hedera? Yeah. So the main thing for us is really the enterprise grade solution that Hedera is. So, you know, we're dealing with a space where some of the cohorts in our uh, in our use case are not particularly Web3 native or not Web3 native at all. I mean, the end the end construction company, bless them, they're renovating bathrooms in an aged care facility. Um, if we start talking to them about you know, scary cryptocurrency and, uh, you know, and things like that, then they could they could get scared off the project. So we wanted to go with a chain that was overtly enterprise grade. You know, when you look at the the, the strength of the bodies on the governing council, you know, this is a, a big confidence builder, not only for the end users in our solution, but when we're talking to banks about what we're doing, when we're talking to the DFCRC and the RBA themselves, being able to say, well, look, we're building on Hedera. Uh, don't panic anybody. It's fine. This is a robust enterprise grade, fast, low cost um, solution. It's just it, it's a big confidence builder. So we're delighted to be to be building on such a platform. Good to hear. Good to hear. So, Nico, I want to move on to you. You know, digital currencies are certainly getting a lot of attention from central banks at the moment. Why do you think this is the case? So I started my career in banking um, and I did lots of different roles within banks. And so I can tell you firsthand that there are so many ways that digital currencies can save a lot of time, a lot, a lot of money in banks. Um, and I think one of my old banking colleagues put it nicely that, that blockchain is just a glorified accounting system. You know, it, it shifts value automatically, manually, quickly and securely. And something that's done traditionally by big teams and, you know, uh, lots and lots of procedures and, and compliance and things like that to make sure humans are abiding by the rules. It can be done by, you know, a few lines of code. So I think there's just costs. I think selfishly banks and central banks just want to save costs. And it's just a huge way to, to tick those compliance boxes as well when you do take humans out of the equation. So a stat from McKinsey uh, says that, you know, 400 billion can be saved each year um, for financial institutions just by 
by moving away from the physical cash infrastructure um, at the moment. So again, those savings are just you know huge, huge money. Um, and the construction use case that these these guys are talking about, we're talking about single transactions of you know millions of dollars, you know huge transactions. And when this money is borrowed, you know with high interest rates sometimes in the construction industry, even a couple of days um, over a weekend and things like that, where you can't get the, the money back quickly, again that's a huge amount of money from the end end user as well. So. I think it just saves money, hassle, and time all around. Um, and I think I'll stop there. But the, the the potential to save money is just is just astronomical, which is why I, I left the TradFi uh, industry and moved into the Web3. So very, very excited by this use case. Well, we're certainly excited as well, Nick. We're certainly pulling for you to stand out in this pilot. I know there's all kinds of different programs, but we want to make sure that you're highlighting the potential for Not Centralized and Hedera as well. Either way, guys, thank you so much for swinging by. We really appreciate you coming by and explaining the pilot in a little bit more detail. Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate it. And those T-shirts. Get us some of those T-shirts, my friend. Yep. No exactly. problem. Sounds good. So that this pilot is definitely exciting. Do you have any thoughts about what we're seeing come out of Not Centralized and the Australian Central Bank Digital Currency pilot? I think what's you know beyond how you no know, this isn't this is incredible. Obviously, Not Centralized, uh, we didn't know about them again in the same way we didn't know about Fresh Supply Co. And then they're suddenly on the scene, and I and I, I can't imagine how many people are also in this situation. You know, very in stealth, slowly yet surely building, or at least thinking of building on Hedera. And then they come out of nowhere and uh, into something like this. But so 15 use cases were selected for the pilot. One we know, of course, is not centralized, built on Hedera for, for various different reasons. But three of those other use cases in the pilot are from ANZ Bank. And, you know, I have no idea whether or not they're leveraging Hedera. Uh, you know, we'll find that out in the future. But I think it's great to see that almost a third of the use cases at least have a very close relationship with Hedera. You know, whether or not ANZ Bank are leveraging Hedera for the CBDC, I have no idea. But ANZ Bank moved their a, uh, ASDC stablecoin, i.e. their Australian digital dollar stablecoin, backed by ANZ Bank, a top two bank. They migrated that from Ethereum to Hedera. So there is a very close tie between, I think the man's name is Nigel Dobson um, from ANZ Bank, and Rob Allen. Um, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, I'm not even sure I'm positive we're on their radar. Again, whether or not we're in the CBDC, who knows? But nearly a third of all those uh, of, of all those use cases have Hedera on their radar. So that that's great to see. Yeah, no question about that. And of course, we're, we're gaining more champions in Australia all the time, whether it's David with Fresh Supply Co., whether it's the team from Not Centralized. You uh, mentioned the team from ANZ Bank as well. Uh, but our biggest champion is and probably always will be Rob Allen down under. And we caught up with him again in Shark Bites to talk about Internet of Things this week. So listen to that one. Good to see you again, Rob. Hey, Brandon. It's great to be back. Good stuff. So this week, let's get into a topic that you've brought up in the past, but we haven't really discussed on Shark Bites, at least in depth to this point, and that's Internet of Things or IoT. First, why is Hedera ideal for IoT? Yeah, I mean, this is less about news and more about musings, I think, this week. I feel like we're we're entering a new phase you know, and by that I mean a lot of the the simple use cases are now being done and being done very well and being perfected. You know, use of Hedera consensus service tokenization. We're seeing you know this great uh, surge in NFT um, and DeFi use. But the more complex industrial uses of Hedera have yet to be fully exploited. And I just get the sense now is the time, and it's a, you know this next year. We'll start to see, you know, those things we call Industry 4.0. You know, the industrial use cases, the uh, interconnection of devices, the incentive models for um, building networks, either layer one or layer two, in order to create the the range, the distributed range of um, support to these devices across, you know, all the different use cases. So, Hedera obviously is really perfect for this because it scales so well you know we're we're talking about billions and billions of connected devices maybe tens or hundreds of billions 
and the connection of those devices can be you know related to data provenance it could be uh, related to microtransactions and incentive models it could be related to quite complex use cases and interrelationships between those things and unsurprisingly those are the three core network services for hedera so <laughs> Data integrity is where, where we you know, put Hedera consensus service use cases. And so provenance of the data coming out of these, uh, these devices, these sensors, um, is paramount. So trust, uh, trust at the edge, you know, trust in devices that are doing things like monitoring soil temperature or uh, moisture or drones. You know? um, so, so data integrity is all important. And then the incentive models, the economies that actually need to be built to incentivize people like you and I to create hotspot or gateways, because these devices are connected by a fairly short range connectivity like uh, LoRaWAN and, and other protocols. So you need hotspots and gateways. And so you need to incentivize in a decentralized world individuals to put them on their roofs or in their schools or on their, in their government, government buildings. So those incentive models are actually tokens, you know, tokenized economies will be built around that. And then, of course, the, uh, the more complex relationships, the orchestration of those services can be done through smart contracts. So it's not, um, not a surprise to me that the Hedera native services actually support these, these really quite um, sophisticated new networks um, at scale. And the scale is necessary. It's going to be distributed. It'll be clustered, maybe. Um, I think we'll probably see some of our first uh, shards, which are you know, a specific purpose networks, maybe using the sharding technology for Hedera, which is very different from other blockchain networks. And maybe even private permission layers. So maybe a, a, a layer two um, network, which supports you know, a specific range of devices like uh, like drones, for example, or even our first, you know, fully private permission version of, um, of, of Hedera, which, you know, now we're open source, we, um, I would expect to see at some point in the future. So for all those reasons, I think Hedera is really, really compatible with the, the use cases that we see, um, both, you know, sort of very um, simple ones like data provenance, um, also data integrity and, and provenance, or all the way up to you know, smart cities and super, super complex um, use cases. Well, you mentioned, you know, there's hotspots, and I definitely want to touch on that some more. But one of the things that I'm kind of noticing with Hedera is the early days of blockchain, there were a lot of use cases people got excited about, but it kind of got left by the wayside. IoT is one of them. Uh, micropayments is another. Mm. Providence of data is another. But it seems like Hedera is now they were left by the side of the road and Hedera's coming by, picking them up, dusting them off and, and making them cool again. But getting back to what you were saying about these hotspots, you know, th there were several in both the Hedera and the Helium community mm. that had a big push several months ago to get Helium to consider using Hedera. Uh, I, I want to get, you know, an update on that initiative, but first, can you just give us a quick recap on what Helium is? Yeah, so Helium is a is a network of uh, it was a network of miners that incentivized, like I said, the the operation of the the nodes on that network. It was a, its own blockchain. It was incentivized through its own crypto um, currency, and the the nodes doubled as these kind of hotspots to allow for the the local networks of, uh, of devices to interconnect. It was built and largely funded by Nova Labs, who are heavily supported by um, Solana and Solana investors. So it wasn't a surprise that they, uh, when they decided that their blockchain was no longer fit for purpose and were looking for another layer one protocol, uh, that they were going to move to Solana. And that was always going to be kind of a very difficult battle to fight. But I like a challenge. And I've got some friends here in Australia, um, in particular, Leo Gaggle, who is a kind of a local steward of the, um, some of the, the Internet of Things networks. He's got his own um, IoT business called um, Open Center. And we've been talking about ways of uh, utilizing Hedera for some, you know, some time, for some years. This was a kind of catalyst for that. He said, look, this is now the time. If we're ever going to switch Helium on to Hedera, then, you know, let's, let's try now. And we kind of agreed that it was it was almost a lost battle, but from the perspective of actually 
um, raising the profile or getting some really smart minds to look at the um, look at the problem. We we accepted the challenge. What ultimately happened was um, so the helium community have their own HIP process, the H standing for helium, but you know, helium improvement um, process, and their HIP seventy seven zero was the the proposal to move on to you know onto Solana or onto another layer one network. Um, like I said, it was a done deal. So we rather cheekily wrote our own HIP 70 or 71, I think maybe, which addressed some of the shortcomings in, in the Nova Labs uh, Helium proposal, um, which we thought were pretty fundamental. You know, they were actually moving off their chain onto another chain, but they weren't using the chain. They weren't actually following their own governance model. The incentives didn't seem to work. And so with Greg Scullard and Pathorn, another developer ad advocate, um, and a bunch of very smart guys um, around them and, and Leo, uh, we wrote this hip, which is still there. You know, you can still go and read it. And I think it's a really very good um, piece of work. In fact, Greg came up with a prototype for this whole thing over a weekend. You know, that's how, well, one, that's how smart he is, but also it's, it's how simple it is to kind of use the, uh, the Hedera uh, network services if you know how. It created, it was back in September, it created a lot of um, interest. There was a lot of, as you can imagine, um, you know, my chain is better than yours on you know, crypto Twitter and uh, Reddit. But actually the message got through and it, um, it, it drove a lot of kind of very you know, reasonable, informed discussion. And hopefully it raised the profile of Hedera in, a, in another community. Like always, we take a very professional and, um, you know, um, uh, and straightforward approach. Um, we engage in, in discussion, uh, but uh, but not in argument. And um, I think we won a few um, few fans in that process. But um, ultimately, and this was before FTX kind of failed and Solana itself, um, you know, sort of took a nosedive. Um, but I understand they finally they've just pushed it out again. But I think it's um, ultimately the migration will be completed uh, next month in April. But as with all these things, you know, being able to experiment and think in a particular way, in a focused way, has uh, has many upshots. And we've learned some lessons. I've, there's a few projects that are um, utilizing the uh, the learnings and some of the, the thoughts that went into that uh, that process. I fully expect to see those bear fruit in the uh, the not too distant future. I think you're probably right. But you know, what are some of your other favorite IoT use cases in the space? Oh man, the, so many. I mean, for those, you know, I've written some some stuff on smart cities, but I'll kind of reel back from the smart city thing for, for now. I'll get I'll get there. So I mentioned the three layers in my head: sort of the, devi the devices, so sensors, and then networks, and then kind of the big complex interrelated ecosystem plays like smart cities. So at the device level, I can't. You know, I, it would be remiss of me not to mention Guardian <laughs> because these projects that are tokenizing the sustainability projects, a lot of the data is collected remotely by connected devices. And those devices use HCS to you know, um, maintain the integrity of that data. That data is then signed by verifiable credentials based um, identity credentials and tokenized. So you know that that's a that's a really really good disconnected but IoT based um, use case. They you then go through. I mean, I, I've my my entry point really to IoT was years ago when I was at PwC and I was working with a um, an autonomous electronic vehicle company called Unity out of Sweden, and AEVs are just big old. IoT devices on wheels, right? So they're they're not they're really as transport mechanisms. They're collecting data all the time, and that data can be monetized. So the transport use cases are always always resonate with me. And so you know, if you have a connected car, then uh, you need to pay for fuel, probably electric. Um, you pay for tolls. Uh, you can pay maybe for for usage of roads by the mile or by the by distance. One of the use cases I often uh, refer to for, as a micropayments use case, but obviously microtransactions and, and IoT devices go hand in hand, is about cars 
automatically bidding for uh, for journeys. So cars will move out of the way or allow another car to, to take over based on the owner's desire to get to the destination in you know, faster or, or, or slower. And one could actually go on, on a journey and you know, let everyone overtake you and make money for having done that. So there's some really funny but but cool uh, ways of thinking about how these interconnected devices can can operate. Of course, everyone thinks about you know fridges paying for milk deliveries, you know, and um, I think that'll that'll come. So and then drones, of course, you you know Neuron um, was probably our first IoT um, use case. I don't want to ignore everywhere because I think everywhere was probably the first, you know, without with medical supplies and, and connected fridges and... Um, and soon water too, right? And that, soon that was water one we talked well, about. I'm, I'm not sure wh- where it stands right now. I have to talk <clears> to <throat> Jennifer, but that was another one. I think it's still going, still running, as, as it were. Um, so yeah, so everywhere you look, there are, there are um, there's data integrity use cases. In terms of the networks, you know, I've already mentioned how, you know, sort of helium kind of formed around incentive models. I think the the next generation of those networks built on Hedera will enable you know, token economies to to incentivize the, uh, you know, the the operation of these these hotspots or gateways or kind of aggregators of um, of service for um, for IoT projects better. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing some of those. And then of course we've got you know like I said, smart cities. So all of this is foundational. So micro payments flowing like you know any other utility, like data or electricity or water. You know, as I talk about all the time. So small amounts of value. When we have a, a web of devices around us, when we give kind of delegated authority using our digital identity to all of those uh, those devices, and then empower them to make micro transactions between them. And then interact with the, you know, the the environment, whether it be through you know accessing um, services or utilities um, within the space in which you uh, one lives. That's super exciting. Not just transport, but we're talking about control systems. Uh, we're talking about um, supply chain. So monitoring perishables is always a really good use case. And then ultimately. Um, back to sustainability, you know, in, in true kind of circular um, form from Guardian to circular economies, you know, that's that supply chains in a Web3 world is actually circular almost by definition. And it needs those sorts of um, that data feed and the provenance of the data feed to, uh, to, to, to drive it and close the loop. So, um, yeah, lots, lots to talk about. And I, I think the going back to where I started, I think I'm seeing a lot of more people realizing that these technologies can be used in a particular way to address all these solutions. And you said, you know, all these big blockchain use cases were the grand ideas of, you know, 10 years ago or six years ago and were put on the too difficult path because second generation blockchains just didn't scale, didn't, you know, couldn't operate, had to go um, private permissioned or had to become centralized or trade off on security in a layer two. None of those things work when you talk about control systems at scale and people's money. We don't have those problems with Hedera. We will see these things happening and, you know, the likes, well, I can't name any names, but big enterprises actually whose uh, stock in trade is city infrastructure are looking at these sorts of uh, networks now for just this reason. So exciting time to have. Exciting indeed. And I'm sure we're going to have to revisit this over and over and over again. I just talked to the Neuron guys. As soon as they're ready to announce exactly what they're working on, I'd love to get them on. Soon. Rob, thank Very you. Very soon, hopefully. Yeah, it, it will be soon. Rob, thanks again for swinging by and we'll see you next week. See you next week. Thanks, Brandon. Bye. So, Zeb, we'll get back to Internet of Things in a second, but I want to turn to AI, another burgeoning technology in the space. We have a team that's working in that space, humans.ai. Do you have any information on that? Yeah, so humans.ai, um, you know, they've got their, uh, they're basically sort of avatar NFTs that are, you know, they're, they're laced with both NFT technology and AI. The, the AI is used for this sort of voice automation, you know, this facial recognition turning speech or or rather text into speech so you can have you know you can have this sort of ai you know theoretically in the future at sort of the front front of house for your shop maybe if you're you know if you're a one-man band 
can have it at the front of your website. It's this sort of dialogue that happens between a computer and a human, but the computer is this sort of AI robot. And, you know, it's a, it's very, very futuristic. But the exciting thing that's happened here is that in the last uh, week, so Crypto Expo Europe, which is the largest blockchain and crypto event in Eastern and Central Europe, awarded humans.ai the, the best AI blockchain technology award. So again, you know, I think last week we were talking about, you know, just the, the quality of some of the projects in our ecosystem, you know, 1 to 11 last week, one best founder for the founder of 1 to 11. And, and, and again, this week we're seeing humans AI. Uh, so it, it just seems that the foundation is really, really, you know, picking up high quality projects and, and, and hopefully that bodes well for us in the future. Yeah, no question about that. There's other teams that are in the space that have Hedera on their radar, but are also working with AI. And one of those is Phoebe. It's a Canadian company. They integrated Hedera a few years ago, and that was around vaccine tracking during the heights of the pandemic. When they did that integration, the CEO of Phoebe said, the Hedera integration enables us to provide our clients a secure, fully public ledger backed credential solution with almost limitless scaling and true public verifiability. And Phoebe was in the news again this past week when they were granted a patent for an AI IoT solution. So this is looping back to what Rob was talking about. So Zeb, what has me excited about all these new technologies is they're not siloed, right? All these exponential technologies, whether it's DLT, which is, of course, at the top of my list, but there's also robotics and AI and Internet of Things. And these things are all going to leverage off of each other as they enter those exponential curves, increasing productivity, increasing efficiency, and hopefully increasing prosperity for society in general. So I'm excited to see what comes out of it. Do you have any thoughts about what we're seeing there? Uh, I think, you know... AI, it, it's not going anywhere but but up. You know, we, we see every day, you know, I think Microsoft have come out, Canva have come out, Apple have come out. You know, obviously you've got ChatGBT, which is, of course is OpenAI, but a big part of that is Microsoft. All the bets are going in this direction, like you said. All of these industries are, you know, are only speeding up. And like you said, there's, there's synergy between them all. And, you know, if we want to, you know, the more we get into an AI sort of centric future, you know, the more we have things like, you know, deep fakes or fake photos or whatever it might be, I think the, the idea of truth becomes ever more apparent and how to prove something's truth or truthful or viable. And I've seen some interesting conversations around sort of how DLTs and, and specifically NFTs or the Hedera consensus service could be used to prove the validity of an image, you know, whether or not that's been generated by AI or whether it's been generated by a person. There are a lot of concerns with AI, specifically around this, this idea of fraud and, you know, understanding what's real or not. But there is a clear, clear utility for DLT there to, to really enable people to know what's true and what's not, what's not real. And we haven't really seen that yet, but I, I saw some really clever minds within the Hedera ecosystem speculating on that as a use case. Uh, and, you know, I, it's beyond my ability to fathom but you know i i trust what they say i think that could be a really interesting use case not only for us but for dlt as a whole to really you know keep ai in check as it were well, of course, DLT is going to fit into that new world of technology, and there has to be entities out there that are going to push for that. And Paolo, he's with the University College London, just started a new endeavor, and that's the DLT Science Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like you said, at the moment, you have things like university students, and they're being taught about robotics, they're being taught about AI, they're being taught about all this new technology. But and slowly but surely, Web3 is becoming part of that conversation. You know, you have different blockchain societies at different universities, but it doesn't feel like it has been, you know, one of the major speaking points, one of the major things that people are specializing in. But then you look at our council and you see, you know, you've got London School of Economics, you've got IIT Madras, you've got University College London, and you think, okay, you know, obviously, these universities are very interested. Obviously, these universities are making their bets. And then you see this week, um, Paolo from Paolo Tusca from University College London, you know, our, our representative for UCL on our governing council, has pioneered this new sort of global nonprofit organization called uh, the DLT Science Foundation, which is a conglomerate of these different universities across the world, whereby they're coming together 
to teach the next generation of students about Web3 and DLT. And so three of the inaugural members of this sort of consortium are IIT Madras, LSE, and UCL, like we just said. But you also have the National University of Singapore. You also have the University of Zurich. So this, this, you know, this consortium, I suppose, I imagine is only going to get bigger. You know, it's not limited just to Hedera GC members, but they are really trying to expand, I assume, to as many universities as possible. And to know that at the very core of that, the leading figure who put this together is Paolo of UCL, who's put out many a time these reports, who represents us at certain, you know, conventions and stuff like that. To know that he's going to be there leading this force, leading this foundation with all of his affiliation and support for Hedera, I think that's that's incredibly bullish. You know, the youngest, the most ambitious, intelligent minds are going to be directly exposed to Web3 and also Hedera through Paolo and the rest of the governing council members. Uh, so I really think this is, uh, you know, the, the very nascent stage of, of something that could be really, really big. Um, across universities globally and and to know that Hedera is always going to be part of that conversation I, I i think is massive yep and like you said we have a great educator leading that charge all right zeb we're going to take one of our famous hard left turns here we're going to go from that uh moving into wallets and more specifically hardware wallets i caught up with andy from Citadel Wallet. He's creating a Hedera native hardware wallet that I think has tremendous potential. You know, of course, you're wary initially, like this is a new hardware wallet. It's going to have to gain trust. But after seeing what he's put together, I'm really excited. So listen to what he had to say. Andy, why did you decide to build a hardware wallet native to the Hedera ecosystem? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Brandon. Being an engineer or developer is not necessary to realize that Hardware wallets are really important in this Web3 ecosystems. For me personally, being in Hedera ecosystem and playing with the network, that was one of the first things that came to mind. How do I protect my private keys? Initially, it was just the H bars, and now there's so much more to protect. You have the NFTs, you have the tokens, you have all kinds of different assets in the future as well. Stable coins, uh, different kind of uh, payment assets that you need to protect. So being an engineer and having that background, I was always thinking, how do I create something, some kind of device that will protect my private keys? First and foremost, I wanted to take care of the security. And then hopefully that device will also benefit any, everybody else in the community. And that's why I decided to build this hardware wallet on, for Hedera. And your question is why Hedera? Because Hedera is one of the fastest and most secure and most decentralized, cost-effective, energy-effective networks in the world. Even though I know that the community is still still small right now, but I'm playing the long-term game. I know this network is going to scale to the millions, and it's capable of scaling to the millions of users in the future. And we're going to start small. We're going to start with our community, make sure that everybody gets their hands on this wallet and be ready for that scale uh, when the Hedera network takes up and many users come in. And there is a lot of opportunities for new users. Uh, you've been in the community for a long time, you know, Hedera user base has been growing almost exponentially since that the NFT started being supported on Hedera and then tokens and then gaming, a lot of very exciting gaming projects are coming on and enterprise use cases are taking off too. So I'm really excited for the future of Hedera and I want to make sure when it starts to take off, we have this very secure hardware wallet ready for everybody to use. Well, it certainly sounds like a good plan. You've already touched on security and it doesn't matter if it's a software wallet, mobile, web-based, you know, security is always of the utmost importance. But when somebody's going to a hardware wallet, they want that extra layer of security. How does Citadel handle that security? Yeah, so initially when I started developing this hardware wallet, I paid a lot of attention to, uh, first of all, doing research in all the hardware wallets existing in the ecosystem, trying to understand what kind of components, electronic components, first and foremost, uh, they use to build these wallets. And then look into broader ecosystem of IoT, secure devices, more uh, the, uh, chips made focused uh, for this kinds of products, secure products, 
of the future because there's a lot of other industries that require high level of security. There is private keys they need to protect. It's not just the crypto. So I wanted to broaden my horizon and try to see where else there is new technologies that I could utilize. And I, I found a few very cutting edge uh, technology based secure elements and microprocessors and decided to uh, completely start from scratch, not u- utilize any of the components that the industry is using right now and come up with a brand new architecture, secure architecture. And our hardware wallet is based on a very high uh, level of security, secure element. Um, it's, it's called Common Criteria 6 Plus. It's a level higher than what Ledger is using. On the microprocessor side, uh, we have a secure microprocessor, which has a lot of cryptographic functions, memory isolation, hardware level isolations already built into it. And other hardware wallets are just using generic microcontrollers. So that's an attack vector if you're using a generic microcontroller. If you have a secure microprocessor combined with the secure element that increases your overall security of the device by orders of magnitude. And then on the software side, of course, you can have a secure hardware, but if your software is not secure, attackers will still be able to access the device. On the software side, we have partnered with head starters, developer team, software team, who are very knowledgeable in Hedera first and foremost, and also some of the team members are knowledgeable in this kind of small IoT device uh, type firmware development. So it was the perfect combination of knowledge from Head Starter side for software development and having the background on the hardware side. I think we have come up with a really revolutionary architecture that's hopefully going to be way more secure than anything else in the market. Certainly makes sense to me. So you already mentioned, you know, there are all kind of assets in the spaces. Of course, we have HBAR, but we have NFTs, we have fungible tokens for all kinds of different applications that are being built around Hedera. So what assets will Citadel Wallet support? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's a great question again. I mean, my frustration with all the other hardware wallets that it was just for crypto transfers. Whenever I wanted to participate in DeFi or NFTs, I had to move my assets from the hardware wallet into uh, the, the software wallet to be able to interact with those dApps. Uh, and I wanted to make something that you can do everything from a single hardware wallet. You don't need to move. If you want to participate in DeFi, you don't need to move assets to a software wallet. You can handle everything uh, from that hardware wallet itself. That's why we decided to be focused on Hedera so that allows us to make the device specific to Hedera and support all of its services. That's the goal. We're going to support NFTs, tokens, HBAR transfers, native staking, smart contracts, which most of the DeFi-based platforms are using. Uh, Scheduled transactions is another very important use case on Hedera, which no other network has. And it's going to get bigger and bigger in the future. There's so many different use cases for that just one transaction type. We're going to support that as well. Uh, one of the most popular use cases for scheduled transactions is secure trade on Hashpad. And people can uh, securely uh, trade peer-to-peer without even the need for smart contracts. So to me, that's that's a really uh, revolutionary transaction type and service that Hedera is supporting. And then there's others, random number generation service, Hedera consensus service. We'll plan to support those in the future as well, but at the beginning, We'll make sure that some of the most popular services uh, on Hedera are supported so users can start interacting with the network without needing to uh, move back and forth between hardware and software wallets. All right. Sounds good. And you talked about interaction. What does the interaction of the users with the wallet look like? Yeah. Um, so in terms of connecting to the devices like desktop computer or mobile or wallet, users will have two different options, USB type C based communication, which is wired communication and then Bluetooth communication. Uh, For Bluetooth, we're going to make sure that it is a very secure communication. I know a lot of people in the community were concerned about Bluetooth. Some other hardware wallets are using uh, Bluetooth as well. We have a different approach to Bluetooth. Even though we're using that protocol, we're going to build a layer on top of Bluetooth protocol. So it's end to end encrypted when communicating between the hardware wallet and the device it's connected to. 
to make sure that we bring that extra level of security to that communication interface. From the user uh, side of things, you will be able to interact with the device itself through a touchscreen display. It's a high resolution, full color touchscreen. It's very easy to uh, navigate through the application. And there is also two buttons. One is for power. The other one is for approving transactions. Again, for security reasons, we decided to have that special one button for pressing and approving transactions. So with, in the case of touchscreen, you won't by accident touch the screen and approve something you didn't want to. With the button, you have to physically press it and hold it for a couple of seconds to approve that transaction. That's for security reasons. So those are the ways to communicate with the device, with the computers that they're connected to. And on the computer side, you will be able to pair with your favorite wallet, initially a uh, software wallet. Initially, we're going to support Hashpack, fully support Hashpack. You will be able to pair with Hashpack day one and create a new account similar to what you were doing with Ledger Wallet and start signing any types of transactions. I have created a quick demo to show people how that whole process looks like. Even though the, we have the demo beta version of the firmware on the Citadel wallet, but it gives you a great idea of how seamless and easy that whole process is going to be. And since Hedera network is so fast and efficient, it really will take you just a few seconds to uh, pair, create the transaction type that you wanted to create and sign it. And the uh, transaction is executed in three to five seconds. So you don't even need to keep the hardware wallet turned on for too long. You just sign and turn it off again and move on doing the uh, other things you were doing. So experience is going to be uh, very seamless. And that was one of my main focuses as well. To make sure that people enjoy this device as much as they enjoy using their mobile devices. Well, Andy, we have some great entrepreneurs in this space, and you're certainly one of them. I'm looking forward to getting my hands on your product. And in the meantime, let's go ahead and check out that demo. Let's do it. Right now, you're seeing the... Uh, Citadel wallet turned on. So you can see there's two different options when you are on the device very first time. You can click new wallet or import wallet. Right now we're going to click new wallet. Then it prompts you to input the pin that you will use to access the device in the following times after initiating. I'm going to use a very simple 0000 pin and then repeat the pin. As you can see, it, the screen is touchscreen. It's very easy to navigate through the application, very user-friendly, and then click OK. Since it's a touchscreen, we can easily scroll through all the words of this account and write them down. Once everything is written down, then we can click Noted. All set private and public key pair has been generated. Now it's waiting for us to connect to Hashpack and pair with Hashpack so we can start signing transactions. So Zeb, one of the things this reminds me of is a lot of the leaders in this space isn't going to be necessarily the big enterprises, but it's going to come from the Hedera and the HBAR community. Andy is a longtime HBARbarian. Uh, he had some skills, he had a great idea, and he wanted to put together this hardware wallet. So if anybody out there has you know, a good idea, is an entrepreneur, is a builder, and wants to build in the space, go for it. Because I think there's going to be a lot of success that comes out of our Hedarian community. All right, so let's move over to to gaming. I know there was a lot of things that came out this past week. And the first one I want to discuss is from Realm. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So Realm are the EA licensed esports platform, um, currently supporting Apex Legends, which is one of the biggest games in the world, one of the most played, one of the most streamed games in the world. And typically, if you're very good at this game, you know, if you're in the 0.01% of skill, you can get paid. But that leaves the other, you know, 99.99% just just playing for playing's sake. And, you know, for a lot of people, that's great. You know, you're, you're a casual gamer. But when you're at the sort of semi-pro level, you know, the people that are playing all day, every day, but aren't financially supported, there's a gap in the market to financially support them. And so what Realm have done is create a, a skill-based league 
whereby lower ranks can play and still compete for money, you know, compete for these prize pools. And so typically, you know, on uh, any esports, you know, within esports as, a, as an industry, there's sort of this Wikipedia-esque platform uh, called Lik- Liquipedia. And on this platform, you know, each game, each pro game, semi-pro game, the data from the game is manually put into that website, which means there's someone in the middle, i.e. a third party, whether that's the game or the coach, the, you know, the esports team, whatever, someone in the middle is able to manipulate that data. Someone is able to say someone is better than they are, someone's worse than they are. There's just a room for fraud, which currently means that a coach looking to recruit someone to their team can't be sure that the data is valid. They can't be sure that their money is going to get what the data says, i.e. the skill set of that player. And so where Realm comes into this is not only incentivizing different skill ranks through competing for money, but they're also incentivizing the top end of the spectrum to leverage this platform to ensure data integrity. And so it leverages the Hedera consensus service. Every single game that goes through the Realm application is recorded on the Hedera consensus service and then fed back into the leaderboards. So if someone gets a kill in game, recorded on the HCS, put on the leaderboard. Someone gets, you know, whatever score at the end of the game, recorded on the HCS, timestamped immutably, put on the leaderboards, so that this leaderboard is an immutable truth layer of every single game that happens on the platform, which means that there is no middleman, which means that there is no room for data manipulation, and which means the cream can truly rise to the top, and coaches and esports team can be you know, safe in the fact that the people they're recruiting are in fact as good as they say they are, or as, as good as the data says it is. So their use case is twofold, getting semi-pro players money and average players money and ensuring that the top players, that their data is truthful. And of course, the, the data integrity side is only enabled by the Hedera consensus service. And I believe later on, there's going to be HTS integrations as well. Uh, but yeah, Realm, this is the esports platform and they're launching season one next week. So very exciting. It is exciting. And, you know, like you said, d- data integrity in the gaming space is big. Of course, in-game assets, we hear about that all the time. And fungible tokens is going to be interesting as well because, you know, we're, we're talking about karate combat. They're going to have their karate token. They have up-only gaming. And if you want to participate in that, they're going to be doing their beta test coming up. So definitely check that out. Participate in that. Get used to it. So when the real thing actually goes live, uh, you're familiar with it and you can leverage it to the fullest. So, as always, Lithos is always busy in this space, and they had a pretty packed crowd at an event recently. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so Michael Mumbao was speaking at GDC 2023. GDC being the Game Developers Conference and one of the biggest events for game developers in the world. And so this is branching out of Web3 and showing a you know notoriously hard industry to woo, i.e. Web2 gamers. It was showing them the power of a AAA game that is even more empowered by the utility of Web3, in-game tokenization. And so I think this is really cool for me is because at the moment, you know, obviously the biggest game at the moment being talked about is The Last of Us. All of these people that were there, all these real gamers were there and understood the credibility of Michael, the credibility of the team. And for the first time probably heard straight from, you know, one of the big players in the industry's mouths, a genuine viable reasoning for why games should enter Web3. So I think for me, yeah, it, it, being at a Web2 gaming conference, having the caliber of Michael there and having him touting NFTs and I assume also Hedera, I think that's you know that bodes well for gaming on Hedera for sure. I'm sure at least some people's minds would have been open to Web3 and they'll look at Michael and go, wow, he's chosen Hedera maybe we should as well. So yeah, I think in terms of sort of the effects that might have could could be very interesting for us. I love to hear about these teams that are working week in and week out, just grinding and creating their products. Uh, another team that we just talked about last week that falls into that category is Legends of the Past. And they just had their Discord open up, right? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I actually, I had a call with Basil, uh, Legends of the Past, Basil founder. Uh, earlier last week and he showed me some of the developments and, and they're looking really cool. 
He showed me some of the new artwork. He showed me some in-game stuff. And uh, I mean, it looks great. You know, they're, they're obviously still in very early stage, but, you know, they're, they're grinding away. Um, you know, they're, they're very keen to engage the community and that Discord is now open. So, um, you know, I'm excited to see where they take us. And speaking of some new graphics, Astronova had some really cool stuff with their Deviants come out this week. So check that out. Let me put your fire. Yeah. Yeah, so not only did they put out the stuff about the Deviants collection, but we've also seen more in-game footage of the Astro Nova universe itself. It looks really cool. You know, again, it's, it's early stage, but, you know, the world looks great. Creativity looks great. The vision looks great. And it's really cool, I think, to see, you know, a high quality game that's relatively far in production out there with this footage. Uh, so, yeah, I'm sure it's on the screen now and it's, it, it, it looks great. Yeah, exciting space for sure. And with that, let's go ahead and get into some network analysis. So over the past 24 hours, we're at over 62 million transactions, and over 30,000 of those are smart contract, the higher value transactions. Time to consensus has creeped up a little bit and is sitting at just over five seconds. And we saw a pretty nice spike in account growth this week. Do you know what was the cause? Yeah, so I mean, in two days, we saw a spike of about 50,000 accounts created. I'm not sure what that is. You know, maybe that's the meme token hype. You know, we've seen Grelf and, and a few others emerge. Or maybe it's Karate that I saw there. I saw their token arrive on the HTS, you know, the, the Karate token. So maybe there's some stuff going on there. You know, hopefully we'll have more insight next week. 50,000 in two days. That's no small feat. We're ever closer to 2 million at this point. What are we on in total? 1,929,000 in total. Considering just a tiny bit over a year ago, I think we're on about 300,000. So that's, you know, that's great to see um, and a testament to the project's building for sure. And moving on to our fungible token summary, wrapped HBAR is at the top. We have Sauce, Dovu, and USDC showing that our DeFi space is strong. Uh, we also have Grelf still in the top 10. And I think the price has gone up even more from last week, right? Yeah, so I mean, I look. I think they peaked today at about forty cents. You know, I, full disclosure: I own a very small amount of of Grelf, but they they are up to. I think they went up to forty and back down to about thirty six. So they're they're still on the rise at Grelf. It's going to be interesting to see how that meme token turns out. And moving down to our NFTs, of course, Ashfall is still in the lead there. But I also think the cosmetics company, ElfU, their use case every week, week in and week out, is in the top 10. So that's good to see. And we have NFT NYC coming up. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So uh, was it last year? I think it must have been last year. We obviously had that huge turnout for NFTs on Hedera. You know, Times Square, billboards or NFTs. The whole of NFT NYC was NFTs everywhere on Hedera. I don't think this year is going to be quite that extravagant, but there is a lot of room for Hedera to promote our NFT community. Uh, so I think they've got a form out at the moment on their page whereby any NFT creator in, in, in the ecosystem, in the Hedera ecosystem, can um, you know put themselves forward to make sure that they're being displayed or promoted in whatever way that is i'm not 100 percent sure how that's happening but they are the opportunity is there if you're a creator so, so definitely get on board there i might head up there myself because of twitter uh, but yeah so i put out a little tweet today about twitter we're probably going to be moving into the closed community beta next week we have our new website up so if you want to register interest there definitely check it out but with my tweet i was trying to get the attention of starburst and the juicy verse uh, because i think there's some good synergies that could take place there but all in good fun all right let's go ahead and get into DeFi. First, looking at DeFi Llama, Hedera's total value locked, not including liquid staking from Stater, is at just over $33 million. Saucer Swap is about flat on the week at about $19 million, and Pangolin's TVL has jumped about a million dollars to about $8.5 million. Covering the farming rewards on some of Saucer Swap's popular trading pairs, HBAR HBAR X is at about 16%, 33% on HBAR Sauce, and 38% on HBAR USDC. 
Pangolin is paying out an average of 150% on HBAR USDC, 19% on HBAR HBAR X, and 450% for HBAR PBAR. One thing to note is that all of these current farms are going to be deprecated next week. This is to allow everyone to get back on an even playing field following the exploit two weeks ago. So sometime mid next week, for those that want to keep participating, you'll want to remove liquidity from the old pools and reprovide it and stake to the new pools. Keep an eye out for official announcements from the Pangolin team for specific dates, times, and details. Moving over to the crypto and HBAR market, at 27,700, Bitcoin is up about 10% on the week and down about 2% on the day. At the time of recording, HBAR is just under 6 cents, down 3% on the week and 4% over the past 24 hours, and that's pretty much in line with the rest of the altcoin market. Bitcoin is definitely catching a bid, filling its role as a macro asset and digital gold. Like I said last week, if Bitcoin holds onto those gains, I think eventually that capital will flow into altcoins. This isn't financial advice, but I will say if the banking and monetary instability increases, I think Hedera is well positioned as I believe it is the most viable network to run an alternative world economy. This might attract capital if things get ugly and the HBAR economy continues to build out. Looking at the HBAR chart, we should see support at about 5.6 cents and potential resistance at about 6.3 cents. All right, Zeb, that's pretty much all I have. Is there anything else you'd like to pass on? Uh, I think, you know, my sort of highlight for this week is, you know, Hedera kind of getting more of a global outreach, you know, um, obviously the community is generally pretty much English speaking, but we've seen, you know, this leap into Japan, we've seen, you know, this, you know, consortium of universities, multinational, you know, across the globe coming together. So it feels like we're going to have all of the right sort of education in the right places and exposure in the right places across the globe to these new communities, to these new languages. Uh, and so I'm hoping, you know, over the next, you know, six, seven months, years, we're going to see more of that compounding, more of this, you know, innovation coming out from these young students coming out from enterprise in Japan. And we're going to really see, you know, a public network be used in the global sense that it is always meant to be used in. Obviously, our council is global. That's much has been clear since the start. But I think it's really going to be cool to see more and more in development in these regions. Uh, so yeah, that's that's my core cool, my core cool takeaway there. Uh, and it's great to see, you know, of course, Australia getting even more doubled down on Hedera there. And, and I, I know that's only going to become more exciting over time. Absolutely. And we'll get some more information from Fresh Supply Co. next week. Hopefully we'll have that for the weekend update next week. There's a few beta tests that are going to be going on. So one, of course, is for Twigital. So sign up for that. The other one is for Karate Combat. That's all we have. We'll see you next week.